Father, we just want to thank you for yet another opportunity to open up your word and to see what your word says on this very important issue of Christian suffering. And uh, Father, we pray you'll lead us through by your Holy Spirit, that as we just hear the words from your word, that your spirit will take them and, and just plant them in our hearts. Father, I'm particularly praying and asking that this seminar will be uh, a real helpful tool in preparing us for the days in which we're living the, and, and also for the days in which we're rapidly approaching. Father, I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, welcome. So the, uh, the subject here is a theology of suffering for the Western Church. And uh, the whole subject of Christian suffering is, is huge. And uh, people have written books. There are many books about it. And, uh, and we're not going to try and cover suffering in general. But we're going to cover specifically suffering for our faith in Christ. Okay, so basically we're going to be talking about Christian persecution. And, uh, and I think it really is a, a very important subject for our day. And uh, right from the very beginning when we were just planning this conference, I really sensed that this whole issue of persecution and suffering needed to be a part of, uh, of this conference. Um, I feel and I believe that the church at large is, is walking or running headlong into a situation for which it's not prepared. And, uh, and I, don't, I, I don't want to put a time scale on it, but uh, I just sense that within a few years we'll be thrust into a situation where we're experiencing even severe persecution for our faith. And when we look at some scriptures this afternoon, then that will become... Uh, very, very clear. And I just want to say this, that suffering for our, for our faith in Christ is by far the main emphasis in the New Testament uh, when we're talking about suffering. Okay, and you'll see that clearly as well as we go through um, this afternoon. And uh, I know you believe with me that the New Testament is an eschatological document. Now, for those who don't know what that big word means, which I struggle to say at times, um, it's talking about end times. The New Testament is, is really all about end times. Now, we know the end times began on the day of Pentecost because it actually says it in Acts chapter 2, where Peter quoted from, uh, from the prophet Joel. Um, but we need to understand that for the early church, they really believed that they, they were living in the last of the last days. And so it's into that eschatological context that all we're going to say about suffering is relevant. And, and therefore for us, if this is the final generation before Jesus returns, then, then all that the New Testament speaks about is particularly pertinent to us. We can learn a lot from how the New Testament church faced such persecution and suffering. Okay, so what does the New Testament teach about suffering pertaining to the last days? There are two or three very real concerns that I have uh, here for the Western Church. Uh, the first one is this, that I sense that the church is almost living in some sort of protected, ignorant bubble at large, and uh, thinking that suffering and persecution happens elsewhere but it will never really reach our own shores. Now, I think that's already beginning to be proved wrong, but uh, I think when, when many believers... Hello? Will there be time for questions? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> definitely at the <laughs> end, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll have questions at the end, or if there's something that's particularly relevant as we go through, feel free. Uh, and, and also, I'd like us to have a time of prayer at the end and pray for the persecuted <laughs> church uh, before, we, before we close. But, but the first issue that I have um, is, is that the Western church seems to be living in this protected bubble, uh, thinking that suffering in the sense of persecution happens elsewhere, but will never really reach our shores. We pray for our brothers and sisters in places like North Korea and China, but mostly never considering that such suffering could ever affect us in the way that it affects them. And if we 
And as we read through the scriptures, you'll see that it is going to affect us in the same way um, that it's affecting them at this time. Secondly, the second concern is that this is reinforced by the fact that there's little teaching on the subject preparing the church for such days. We prefer, you know, we prefer to think about uh, revival and blessing and healings and miracles and, and, and all this sort of stuff, and I'm not decrying uh, those things. Um, but rather than talk about suffering, suffering doesn't attract people to the church. You, know, you don't gain many church members by talking about uh, persecution. And thirdly, there's the doctrine of us all escaping major suffering by being raptured uh, before it actually happens. And so with films that have been produced um, over, you know, down through the years, um, we have situations where life is going on, Western life is going on in all its sort of like prosperity and uh, affluence and so on, and then suddenly a whole bunch of people disappear. Okay, so they're immediately translated from this position of affluence and, uh, and, and wealth and so on, immediately into the presence of God. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I struggle with that. I believe it's unbiblical. And I also think it's dishonoring our, our brothers and sisters around the world. You know, we talk about, uh, you know, we're, we're going to escape um, suffering at the end times. And uh, we think, well, hold on a minute. You know, two-thirds of the church around the world is already suffering severely for their faith in Christ. And so it's dishonoring them. Okay, so let's start by really looking at what did Jesus teach. The first three scriptures that we're going to be looking at are in those passages where, where Jesus is giving signs uh, of the end times, signs that would uh, precede his coming. The first one is in Matthew chapter 24 and verses 9 to 10. We're just going to read through a load of scriptures. I want you to go away armed. I think you've got the scriptures written down on your notes, but you just, just fill out whatever content you can. But Matthew 24, verses 9 to 10, this is what Jesus says. He says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. I think that scripture is as relevant for the West as anywhere else. Another scripture, Luke 21, verses 12 to 19. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be a time for you to bear testimony. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and kinsmen and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. And when, when Jesus says, not a hair of your head will perish, I don't think that means physically. I think uh, he's, he's introducing the eternal context there. And when he says, by endurance, you will gain your lives. And then in Mark chapter 13 and verses 19 to 20, Jesus says, for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not shortened the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Now there it's talking about some intense persecution that's going to be taking place uh, in the last days. Two other scriptures that Jesus, uh, where he spoke about suffering, uh, more general scriptures, not immediately in the context of the very last days, but still very true. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, where Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely 
on my account. So suffering results in the blessing of God upon our lives. And we will see that there is a very, very, there is a very real positive uh, element to suffering in the sense of um, suffering for following Jesus Christ. Then in John chapter 15, verses 18 to 21, and then 16, 1 to 4, Jesus said this, If the world hates you, know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all this they will do to you on my account, because they do not know him who sent me. I have said all this to you to keep you from falling away. And that's a key statement, I think, there. Jesus here, this was just before he was crucified. He was preparing his disciples for, for what lay ahead. And he says here, I have said all this to keep you from falling away. That needs to be being said today in today's church. But it's not being said, and we'll see the consequences of that uh, as we go through this afternoon. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. They will do this because they've not known the Father nor me. But I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. So Jesus here spoke very clearly to his disciples about the need to prepare for suffering in the sense of being persecuted for following him. They were under no illusions right from the very beginning. And, and we know it's true because right from the very beginning when we read the Acts of the Apostles, very quickly, we only have to get into Acts chapter 3 before the disciples found themselves in trouble. But they were prepared. They were prepared because Jesus diligently prepared his disciples. And my uh, suggestion is that we need to be doing the same. Those of you who are church leaders, elders, home group leaders, this message is urgent to take back to our churches. Okay, let's move on and see what some of the others uh, in the New Testament said about suffering. What about Paul? We know that uh, four of Paul's letters were written when he was in prison for his faith. The letters uh, of Ephesians, and i just give you one or two references so you can look them up. Ephesians 4 verse 1, we won't read it out because of time. Uh, Philippians, and that's, uh, you can look up Philippians 1 verses 12 to 14 where Paul specifically refers to being in prison. And then the letters to the Colossians and the personal letter to Philemon. So Paul certainly knew what it was to suffer. And the first scripture we're going to look at here, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 22 to 33, this is Paul's testimony, his personal testimony of suffering for following Christ. <clears throat> Paul writes this, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. With far greater labours, far more imprisonments, countless beatings, often near to death. Five times I've received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I've been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I've been shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brethren, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. 